Amen. Now, as we, you know, as we mentioned, it's going to be just a couple weeks that we're looking at really our church mission. And we talked some about last week and the whole church mission statement. And, and you see it out in the lobby, you know, that we every once in a while we want to remind you, who are we as a church? We're people that are committed to know Christ, his life-changing power, and to make him known. And that's not just something that we've thought up on our own. As we've studied the Bible, we said, this is what we believe God has called us to. And we, and we embrace this in an optimistic way in the midst of a, in a struggling world. We want to embrace this. Why? Because we believe that God has called us as a church to not only know him, his life-changing power, but to make him known and then to bring that message into the world so that we're called to literally storm the gates of hell. And as we, as we advance, that, that as we advance in God's power, there are going to be times that it looks like a setback but we're going to be victorious because God has promised that. Satan will not be able to with, with, uh, withhold the advance of the church. So now what does that look like? And that's what I want to look at more this morning is practically how do we live this out? What's that look like for us as a church and as for us as individuals? Now before I go there, I want to start by asking a question. If, if you are a parent, think you know, if, you know, if they might be grown, they might be from the time that they're little to the time to where they're at now. When have you been most proud of your children? You know, the idea of being proud of our children is an important one. It's important, especially for children. It's obvious as you look at younger children, the importance that they place in the idea of, of having their mommy and daddy be proud of them. They want to see that smile. Uh, perhaps this is most obvious with young children. I mean, if anybody has a young child, you know, they're in children's church right now, and if, if they're doing any kind of craft, any kind of drawing, what's going to happen when you pick them up? If you had a young child, you remember this, you know, that you go and you pick them up, and the first thing they did, hey, daddy, look what I did. You know, mommy, look what I did. Or in their preschool or in school, and you go in that, you know, that early visitation, and they want to take you to their desk, and they want to see you, or, or for you to see what they've done, because they want to hear, boy, good job, I'm proud of you. They, they long for that. And, um, you know, look at my project. And, or, you know, I love, we have our preschool here, and I love, especially like, like at Christmas, they have a big Christmas uh, concert. And it's fun to come and watch these little preschoolers at the Christmas concert, because they're all lined up, and the first thing they do is they look for the mom and dad. And you can see as soon as they see them, you know, they line up here, and all the kids are, hey, hi, you know, and some of them, you know, don't only wave, they're, hi, mom, hi, mom, and they're going to shout out until mom waves back. Because they want to make sure that as they sing, that mom and dad are there to hear them, and they want to see that pride. It's something that's key. As kids get older, you know, they don't stop looking. They just make it a little less obvious. They still look. They just don't wave. And, uh, you know, but you see it especially like kids, if they get into sports, when they go and they, they big, a big play, if they score a goal, or first thing they do is they look in the stands. You know, did dad see? Was mom, did mom see? They want that pride. They, they, they long to hear, I'm proud of you. And they strive for whatever they think that will bring that, res that response from their parents. Now, if you're a parent, I'm going to ask, again, what are all, out of all the things that your children have ever done, what has made you most proud? You know, can you think of something that just stands out to you that, boy, this is when I was proud of them? Now, let me turn that around. If we believe that, the, as the Bible says, that as, as, a, as followers of Christ, that we are children of God, if God is our heavenly Father, what makes God most proud of us? And how important should that question be? Should we be driven by seeking the pride, the, the smile of God, in a sense? You know, when does God look down on you, in a sense, with tears in his eyes, say, I'm proud of what you're doing. I'm proud of who you are. Let's look at, uh, if we you know, mentioned a moment ago that our main passage is going to be 2 Corinthians 5. Look at what it says in 5.9, if you have your Bibles open. Paul says, so whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him, him being God. And Paul is saying, as children of God, we should make it our goal, our aim in life, our priority in life is to please God, to make him proud. And just as we see that, that driving desire of a young child, so it should be our driving desire to live in such a way that we, that we achieve the pride, the, the smile in a sense of God. Now, we may look at that and we say, well, in our life, you know, we do things and some, you know, my parents didn't notice that. Man, they missed that goal. They weren't there for that event. Or, or we may do things and, 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 it's, and it fades. They, they see it for a moment and then you forget. The incredible thing is that when we live for God's smile, there's nothing that escapes his notice, and also there's nothing that he forgets about. Look at verse 10. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each, must, each, each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now here's what you need to realize, that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then because of your faith in Jesus Christ, we don't have to fear about being judged for the wrong that we've done. That's the message of the gospel. If I stand before God and God judges me based on my behavior, I'm in big trouble. I'm gonna re- I deserve his punishment. But the gospel is that Jesus Christ came and when he died on the cross, he took my sin and he took my punishment for that sin. And so that if I ask him to forgive me, I trust in him, my sins are taken off of me, they're put on Jesus Christ, the punishment for that sin is put on Jesus Christ, he pays it all, he pays the full cost. So therefore, the judgment seat isn't a place that I fear being judged for my sinfulness, No, my sinfulness, there's nothing, there's no shame before God. It's all covered in Christ. The judgment seat is where then God will judge me for what we've done. We will give an account for the good things that we've done since we've come to know Christ. What are the rewards that God will give us for the the way that we've lived our lives? What are the treasures that we've stored up for ourselves in heaven? You know, people talk about this idea in the Bible, it's in the Bible, you know, that we receive crowns because of of what we've done. Well, what are those crowns? What are those rewards? And I think what Paul is saying here is we need to realize that the ultimate reward is the pleasure and pride of our Heavenly Father. Let me give you a picture of what I believe the ultimate reward is. We're there in heaven and we're enjoying all the joys and blessings of heaven and suddenly we look across and there we see somebody that we knew in life. And we realize that they're there in part because we, God used us as a part of leading that person to saving faith in Jesus. And we suddenly remember that. And then that person looks over and they see us. And you see in their eyes, they remember. And you see that, thank you for telling me about Jesus. Thank you for telling me that I could be here because you were a part of that. And then as we we see them and we look over here and suddenly we see Jesus and we see that Jesus is watching our eye contact. And you realize that at that moment that Jesus himself realizes what's going on. And Jesus remembers, you know, that part of the reason that person here is you told them you were faithful and you see Jesus smile in his eyes. You see the pride. You maybe even see him say, I'm proud of you. And you realize that for all eternity, every time you see that person, there's going to be that reminder. For all eternity, when you look at Jesus Christ, there will be that reminder, that pride. I'll tell you, there's no greater reward than living in eternity with that, with that pride that you see in the eyes of Jesus Christ. That's what we're driven by. That's what he says here, that we're motivated by this pursuit to please my Father. And how do we do that? by telling other people about the gospel. Look what it says in verse nine again. It says, so whether we're home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Verse 11, how do we please him? Therefore, knowing the fear of God, we persuade others. How do we please him? By persuading others. And we say, what about the fear of God? You know, it's, you know we're driven by this love of God. What does that mean? See, when we look at what it says, it's calling about the fear, it's talking about love. See, the word fear here, when it says knowing the fear of God, we persuade others. The fear here could be translated reverence. And and if I were to use this word talking about my children, that they fear me in a proper way, what I'm saying is that they're not afraid of me, but they desire my pride, they desire my love, they value what I have and how important I am to them. They, They don't want the thought of me being disappointed in them. And so Paul is saying, because we know that God loves us and because we love him, we're afraid of doing anything dumb or foolish. We're afraid of wasting our, way, our lives. We don't want to do something that would make him ashamed. But instead, we don't, we don't want to disappoint our daddy. We want to make him proud. We want to do things that will make him proud and that will bring his smile. And what is he saying? How do we do that? God is most pleased in us when we share our faith with others. Again, now look at verse 14. It says, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. It says, you know, I love Christ, and it's the love of Christ, my fear of him, the the passion that I have to please him controls me. If I really understand how loved I am and the importance of that relationship with God, it will cause me to live differently. It will control me, it will compel me. Why? Because what I realize is that it changes me. 
Look at verse 17, he continues the thought. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. Now, now we often read that and we talk about the idea that we are changed as followers of Christ, and we are. But in this context, it's not just saying that we are a new creation, it's saying that our value system has changed, our purpose has changed. In a sense, we are not only saved from our sin and saved from the person that we were, but we are saved to a new purpose. We are saved to live for eternity. We are saved for a purpose that matters. You know, that everything has changed. We're not just part of the rat race that everybody was living in. Our life suddenly has meaning. Our life has purpose. So we are different, and the very purpose that we live is, is different. Continues on in verse 18. And what is that purpose? And this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us, or to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. Making his, God is making his appeal through us, and we implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So you know what he's saying? We've got to realize that we have been given a great gift. We have been reconciled with God. Through Jesus Christ, we were separated from God, but Jesus Christ reconciled. Our sins are forgiven. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our life is different. And now because we know that, because we know Christ and his life-changing power, we want to make him known. It's that awareness of what we received should drive us to now share that with others. Again, verse 20, we are amb- therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. And God is making his appeal through us. Because we have been reconciled, we now are driven to share it with others. You know, and, and, and you know, this is whole idea. Now, I want to tell you, I recognize that if somebody might be visiting and they're like, you know, especially if you don't have the relationship with Christ and you're like, okay, well, this is all motivational and it's about growing the organization and that's not at all the case. It's not at all about, you know, well, membership drive and we need to get more people here Our primary concern, my primary concern as a pastor and our concern of the church is not just focused on growing to our numbers of the people that will attend here. Our motive is that each one of us have experienced this life-changing power of Jesus Christ and because we have been changed, we want to share it with others. It's something that is so meaningful to us, we can't help but share it. You know, now, now if you're here again, if you're not a believer, I want you to see that when we do this outside of faith, we understand it. Let me give you an example. I mean, this is a little, it's a very, a little, a little unusual, but it's true. I had a friend of mine who, uh, uh, years ago, developed colon cancer. It's a very nasty, nasty form of cancer that ultimately took his life. And after his diagnosis, he learned that cancer, that that kind of cancer can be identified very early through, uh, you know, through a colonoscopy and can be treated. Now, colonoscopies can be an extremely effective form of diagnosing colon cancer, but they're also amongst the least pleasant tests to get. And anyone who's had one would say, amen, yeah, we agree with that. And he was driven by his desire to avoid the unpleasantness of the test, and meanwhile, that, that avoidance led to his development of cancer that was beyond cure. Now, the result was that he realized this, he became an evangelist for colonoscopies. Now, out of all the things that you could be an evangelist for, you wouldn't think a colonoscopy would be real high on that list. And, uh, you know, imagine here you're, you know, you're saying, let me tell you this great message. You need to go to the doctor and you need to get him to stick a camera up your, well, well you need to get him to put a camera where cameras don't usually go. And, uh, you know, that's not an exciting message. And, and I mean, I'd literally, I'd be with him and we'd be talking to a stranger and his cancer would come up and he's telling the stranger that they need to go get a colonoscopy. And I'm stopping to think about, this is a really an unusual thing for a person to be talking to a stranger about. But the thing is, is he believed it. He said, you know, this can save your life. I want to share that. And although it was unusual, people understood this was important. Now, I want to tell you, you know, we re- people respected his passion for that because they were concer- he knew that they were concerned about their health. Now, if he could be that passionate about colonoscopies, you know what, I've got a better message than that. Yeah, cancer can eat away at the body and it can lead to a terrible death, but sin is a cancer that leads against the, eats against the soul and it leads to not only death in this life, but eternal death. And our message of God's love and sin, may, God, love and, and, and sacrifice for sin may seem uncomfortable, but you know what? He's willing to go beyond the discomfort because this is important and there's no more important message than we can possibly give 
then the, the people need the saving faith of Jesus Christ. And so that's what Paul is saying, is that we need to be committed to bringing this message of reconciliation. God is making his appeal through us. And if we fail to get that message out, it's not going to go out. So God's saying, okay, now here, now you have experienced this, now go share it with other people. He's calling us to, I believe, a commitment to intentional and personal evangelism. Something that it's a call to each one of us. You know, last week we looked at Matthew 28, and we saw the Great Commission, and we talked about that. And uh, let me put it back on the screen here. And he's giving the, you know, to the, not only the disciples, to the church. This is your call. You know, he says, I'm about to go to heaven, and I'm not taking you with me because I'm leaving you here to accomplish this purpose. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." And he's calling us to something, and people look at this and say, well, it's called for the church to be involved in evangelism. And that's only half true. You see, it's not just the church. He's calling Christians who make up the church to be involved in evangelism. See, there are many people that say, what's the church? And what they think is, well, what that means is that if I give some money to the church, if I give some money to the missions, well, then then we'll go out and we'll hire the pastors, we'll hire the missionaries, and they'll go do evangelism, and then I'll feel like we're doing a good job. And uh, we're being evangelistic. I'm a part of an evangelistic ministry. But the problem is that when you look at this, what is he calling us to do? He doesn't say, now send. He says, go. Go make disciples. The Great Commission calls us to go, not just to send. Should we send missionaries? Should we support? Yes, we should. But it's a call to each one of us to personally be involved and to go and to recognize that God has called us to be a missionary. He's given us, each one, a mission field. He's put you on a mission field where you can reach people I never could. He's uniquely equipped you, and he put you there, and he says, now go. And so when we look at this, well, how do we go? Well, it's real easy, again, to say, well, you know, real common thing is people say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to live out my Christian life, and and I hope that somebody notices it, and then they'll come and ask me about it. And uh, and if they ask me, I'll share. I hear that all the time. You know, I'm going to say that, that's the, that's the little Bo Peep approach to evangelism. And, uh, and it's opposed to the good shepherd approach. Now, what is a little Bo Peep approach to evangelism? It's simply this. Think about little Bo Peep. Okay, we all know little Bo Peep. What does it say? Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. So what she's going to do, leave them alone, and they will come home wagging their tails behind them. And that's what we often say is, I'll live out my life, and hopefully somebody will notice, and their life will be messed up, and they'll come, and they'll ask me. And churches do that, as individuals, Christians do that. Now, the thing is, is that that sounds great, but how many of us, that's our story, that our life was messed up, and so we went and found a Christian and went and asked them? Probably not many of us. You know, most of us are here because someone went and found us. It it sounds great, except it doesn't work, and it doesn't work because it's not biblical. See, the biblical picture is that of the good shepherd. And we look in in Luke chapter 15, the good shepherd, he lost one of the sheep and he left the 99 and he went out into the world to find the one that was lost. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to go, but we're called to build relationships with unbelievers and to try to look for the opportunities to share our faith. God's called us to do that as a church and he's called us to do individuals. When you look at the early church, if you look at the example of the early church, that's how they grew. You know, I think sometimes we look at the early church and we see in Acts 1, you know, there's, you know, there's 120 people. And then in Acts 2, we hear pre- Peter preach a sermon and 3,000 people come to know Christ. And, and we say, okay, that's it. They're great preaching. And that's what happened. Look throughout the book of Acts. Every other time it mentions the church's growth, it is not associated with preaching. Every time it talks about the church's community and what they were doing, and how they were living out the gospel, and the relationships that they were building, and because of the individual actions, not because of the preaching, but because of the membership, each one living out their faith, we're told because they were doing that, the church grew, and God added to the number daily. That's the way that God did it then, that's the way that God does it now. Now, I want to tell you, I recognize as we challenge you to this, a lot of us say, well, how do we do this? What's it look like? And... um, and, 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 and I can give you some practical ideas. Even as we were talking about this amongst the staff, you know, I realized that even amongst our, ch- our staff, some of the men on our staff, you know, it's, you know, we have different ideas. There's not like, here's the right way to do it. And you know, we have Joseph, who works with teens, and Bob, who's not, you know, just come on staff, and he's been working with college, and Gary, who's worked with homeless and with seniors, and, and you have these different men who have 
you know, spheres of influence, but different personalities. So rather than just me share all my ideas, I'm going to ask them to come up. And, uh, and I'm going to ask them to share just, you know, just some of their thoughts and, um, you know, so that we get to hear some different ideas. What's it actually look like? And uh, I'm going to have you all come up here and, and, and sit up here. I think there's another, another mic up there. And I'm going to ask you all, you know, starting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, Bob, people, you know, people, you know, you're the newest, and uh, so I'll let, I'll let you begin. You know, the, really the question is, you know, if, if you were to get together with a friend and try to share the gospel, what does it look like? How do you do that practically? Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, I have a couple thoughts. When, when I was thinking through this after we had all talked, what first came to my mind was uh, the reality that there does need to be some sort of relationship. Now, that relationship can look like a lot of different things. It can look, at, look different depending on your circumstances and your, your context, but, uh, but there needs to be some sort of relationship because it's in relationship that we connect to people and that people will take us seriously. So that was my first thought. My second thought was there needs to be scripture involved. And so I, I wanted to read you quickly uh, Hebrews 4.12 which states, as soon as I find it, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So we can describe God and uh, what he's done in our life, and that's wonderful, but there's a reality that there is power in the word of God. And so I would recommend if you're gonna share and when you share your faith that you have a couple scriptures. Now that can be, I mean, a lot of people use John 3.16 or, or Mark 10.45. Uh, I like the Romans road, which walks through Romans and gives the whole uh, gospel through, through the book of Romans. It's five to seven verses. And if you're interested, you can just Google Romans road and it'll come up uh, on the internet and you, can, and you can look up what the verses are. But, but the word of God is, is key. The, the third thing that comes to my mind that's really important is then the follow up, whether they accept Christ or not, uh, to be a presence in their life. If they do accept Christ, then the task becomes how do, how do they become discipled? How do they become more like Christ? And you're key to that. And if they don't, that you're still there, still loving them, still witness to them uh, as you continue to interact in the, in the normal life and as you still have that friendship, that relationship. And I think that's key. We talk about relationship that, you know, that a lot of times we see it as an, an event. I'm going to go out and share my faith. And it's not. You're saying it's a relationship. It's, some, it's a friendship, and it's shared out of the context of that relationship. That's key. So is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, Gary, what would you, how would you build on that? Well, I've, I've thought about this, and I've thought about, I know, I know it takes, you have to have a relationship. I know early on, uh, you know, I, I believed in the resurrection when I was about 13 or 14 years old. I never really committed myself to walk with the Lord like I should have. I didn't have a lot of people in my life that, that I didn't have any men come alongside of me. But, uh, but I had people occasionally that would come up to me and, and uh, they, would, they would sometimes get things out of order. And, I, and I'm going to share what I mean by that. The psalmist says that... Uh, he remembers the testimonies, God's testimonies, and he keeps them in his soul because they're wonderful. That's what he says. What are testimonies? They're stories. And I think, I know for me, maybe not everyone's the same way, but I know for me, uh, I want to know if somebody really cares for me. You get to know people through relationships. You listen to their stories first. And the Bible tells us be quick to listen and slow to speak. And I think there's a reason for that. We listen to their stories with the hopes that we build relationships and they'll ask us about our stories. And of course, our stories, because we know Jesus Christ, our Savior, include Jesus Christ as our Savior, which leads, hopefully, to his story, the great story. And uh, I've seen it do that many times, so I know it works. And ultimately, that's where you're going. And you want, to, you want to share with the folks. And, you know, everybody hurts. Everybody has problems. And everybody has a story. I think the problem with older folks sometimes is they, know, they think everybody knows their story. <laughs> and you have a lot of things to share. And uh, 
uh, sharing your heart with someone else and listening to them. I think it's a very, very important thing when you bring Christ into the mix. You're promoting the gospel. You're, you're sharing with people what they need to hear because it's life-changing and life-giving. Yeah, I think that's key, you know, but it's, it's got to start with listening. And, and a lot of times you need to do a lot of listening. You know, but if I spend a lot of time listening, sooner or later they're going to be more open to hearing what I have to share. And, uh, and, and we think of evangelism as talking, and, you know, but if it starts with listening, all of us can do that. So, I think people think of evangelism as talking because evangelists talk a lot. <laughs> I really, yeah. I mean, I've seen that, and, yeah. and uh, it's not necessarily always true. I know, you know, we need to have something to share, and I, I think one of the one of the key elements is is like the 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 psalmist said, think about the stories of God. They're very important to us because I don't know about you, but they lift me up, they encourage me, and they've been part of my life. Whenever I have problems, whenever something comes along that, that is overwhelming, and I can remember uh, how God has done things in my life, that, that's my story. It's a small story in the big story, but other people need to hear that because they need that, and they need the big story. Yeah, well, thank you. Now, Joseph, again, you work with a different group of people, but is... Is your, are your ideas similar? Do they build off of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of my thoughts absolutely build off of both those things, both the relationship and the scripture and the story. Um, and particularly with, with uh, the teens that I work with, uh, I find story to be extremely valuable. Um, you know, in today's culture, most people are going to be very uh, turned off if you, you say, hey, uh, why don't we sit down and I could, you know, share the five points of Calvinism and the gospel and just go through this with you. Um, but if you say, hey, like, let's get together, I'd love to get to know you more and just hear your story, um, especially in youth culture, people are very open to that. Um, I want to go to Starbucks, I want to go to coffee houses and to, uh, you know, IHOP and just sit down and eat and talk about um, their lives and talk about their stories. Um, and it's something that's very comfortable, uh, particularly with teens, to say, hey, you know, come out um, and, and share your story. And I think it's not just older people. Um, you know, I find that, that a lot of people, if you ask, they ask them, do you know your friends? Like, how well do you really know them? Do you know their story? Um, they don't, you know what I mean? And a lot of times, even if you know someone really well, um, you only know them really well since you've known them. And you don't know a lot about um, what's happened in their past. And um, so getting together and say, hey, I want to hear your story. I want, I want to know you and I want to know what, what your life story is. That's awesome. And like Pastor Mike's saying, um, a lot of times that opportunity is then reciprocated to say, oh, what is your story? And, and the reality is, is if your story isn't laced with the gospel, if it's not um, kind of hiding in every crevice of your life, um, then how much are you, have you really been changed by it? You know what I mean? Um, and if, if you're really a Christian, that's really something that, that's that important to you. It just kind of comes out of your story, right? And I think the, the really neat thing, and I think what you see Jesus do time and time and again, and one of the greatest uh, examples is Zacchaeus, but you also see it with women at the well and the centurion, is you see um, Christ like speak directly into people's lives. Right? He, he knows them so well that he's able to come into their lives and he's able to speak to directly what's happening in their lives, whether it's a greedy tax collector or you know, a woman at the well who has had you know, five husbands or a centurion who uh, has this sick person. Like He knows the intimacies of their lives. But the reality is, is, is Christ had a huge advantage in that he was fully God um, and didn't necessarily have to have someone tell him these things to know them, right? Um, so he was able to just skip ahead um, with some of those things and really engage really quickly. But for us, we need to engage. We need to be able to know those things about people, to know their backgrounds, to know their hurts and pains, and then be able to speak the gospel directly into those things. And I think that's when you really see the gospel become tangible to people, and that's when it really takes hold in their lives. And I think even if, if you were to ask any of us or to ask any of you, um, those are the people in the moments that stuck out to us in our lives um, and that really made the difference. Um, you know, I think all of us can probably look back and see, you know, there was, there was that one or, or more person who came alongside and who really invested, who really got to know us and spoke the gospel into those intimacies of our lives. And that's what made the difference. Um, and so, yeah, I really think that that's where the gospel connects. Now, one thing that I was just even thinking, we didn't talk about this before, but I was remembering a couple weeks ago, you know, one thing that you were especially sharing is this idea of almost entering into their story and you know, coming alongside and doing things, you know, finding common interests. And, you know, Gary, I know you talked about, you know, you're building cars and you find somebody and you bring them into that if that's what they enjoy doing. And that can lead to an opportunity to share your faith or, you know, sports or whatever that would be. 
uh, in work or, or you know, just you know, working around the yard or whatever that would be. If you find, you know, we had guys out yesterday playing golf. You know, boy, if that's that common interest, enter into that story and use that as a chance to be able to go from doing life together to talking about life. How do you build on that? Any of y'all? No, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, like I was saying a couple weeks ago, I think the gospel happens best in the rhythms of normal life. Um, you know, I, I, you don't see necessarily Jesus necessarily coming alongside people just out of the blue and being like, hey, like, let me just share this with you right now because it doesn't make any sense to you. He kind of enters in, you know, he's like, hey, I'm going to come stay at your home or, you know, I'm going to sit down with you and have this, this conversation um, at the well which is some place that it was, it was a hub of their community. It was a place that she would already have been. Um, and you really see that become effective um, more so when you enter into someone's normal rhythms, um, when it's not something that's just natural. And those are the people that you can think about, that you can, that you can find that really need the gospel and that you're going to be most equipped to reach are the people that are already in your community. Um, not that you can't reach out to someone who's beyond that, that's beyond your normal spheres, but if you think about the people that you bump into at work, um, that you bump into um, at Starbucks, the people that you bump into as you're doing normal life, those are the people you're best equipped to reach because those are the people you have the most in common with and that you rub shoulders with the most. And the, honestly, the more relationship you have, the more opportunity you have to bump into them, um, the greater opportunity you have to share the gospel. Good. Or, or Bob, were you going to? I was going to say, of course, all of this takes intentionality, you know, uh, to get into somebody's story and know who they are. To a certain degree, you need to know your own story and think through that and, uh, and be ready to share the gospel. Well, think through, well, how, how do I share the gospel? Uh, there's, again, dozens of ways, but think through one or two ways and, and have it ready. And so it does take some intentionality and even, even some preparation, but that doesn't have to be this huge belaboring thing that you spend hours upon hours upon hours on, but, uh, but just to know well, why, is, why is God important to me? And I think uh, what comes along with that too is not to be mechanical. You gotta be careful not to be mechanical. When I see someone that's mechanical, like uh, in the past, when I've seen someone's mechanical with the gospel, I usually just turn them right off. I used yeah. to do that. And, uh, but I, I know this. I know when you interact with people, like Joseph is talking about too as well, when you interact with people and then they find out that you're a committed believer, a follower of Christ, but if they've, you have something that you connect with them on, like, well, I don't know, like uh, building a car or, uh, I don't know, there's a number of things. I love to fish. I, don't love it more than Jesus, but I like to fish, and I used to hunt and do things like that. And uh, I like to do woodwork. There's a lot of things I like, and, and I'm, I'm not a master of any of those things. But, but when people find out, gee, this guy's just like me. He's just like me. He likes the same things I like. And he likes Jesus, too. <laughs> then, uh, and I think it kind of breaks the ice, and people are a little more willing to talk then, too, as well, and to receive what you have to say. Uh, well, I want to thank you all for sharing. They all have a lot more to share, but they, they need to get their own, mess, own sermon to be able to share that. So, and, uh, but thank you all so much for sharing, and uh, I appreciate it. And it, and it is. It's, it's important to see that when we look at these issues, there's not a certain way. It's based on our personality and our relationships on the mission field where God's given us. And, um, you know, some practical things. Now, now, let me go to there and say, okay, now how do, how do we make it very specific? I want to give you a very specific challenge to close. Uh, I want to challenge you. I'm, we're doing a, 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 I'm going to call it the 3 two, one challenge. There's a little insert in your bulletin. Take the 3 one challenge. I, I, want to, I want to give you a very specific. Are you willing to say, God, I want to be driven by seeking your pleasure. I want to embrace the Great Commission. I want to be part of this community that's seeking to know you, your life-changing power, and to make you known. And what are the three, two, one? First of all, the three, pray for the practical and spiritual needs of at least three unbelieving friends on a daily basis. You know, to say, last week we said, think about who in your sphere of life that are unbelievers that God's calling you to pray for. I want you to think about that. Are you willing to say, at least three people I'm willing to daily, on a daily basis, I want to pray for them? Not just spiritual needs, practical needs as well, because I want to engage in their story. I want to be concerned about the whole person. And so, so that's the first thing. Okay, I'm going to do that. You know, who are three people God's laying on my heart? So I'm going to pray for them on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, and, and one of the things that I'll tell you, I have, you know, I've, I've talked to older believers who are, are evangelists that are, have a, a heart of prayer, and I, you know, I'll ask them, who have you prayed for regularly 
over the course of your life. And they'll tell me, you know, and I say, how many of the people that have you prayed for regularly have come to know Christ? And it's amazing, the vast majority of the people they pray for regularly come to know Christ. And so, but part of that is, God, I, I'm willing to commit myself to, to start by finding at least three people I'm going to pray for them on a daily basis. Two, I'm going to take those three people and I'm going to spe- uh, commit to spend intentional time with each person at least two times before the end of the year. Now, that's getting together and building the relationship. It doesn't mean getting together and, okay, well, here's the four laws, here's the... You know, I want to tell you, it may be something you get together, and if God opens up the door to share the gospel, you may go there. It it may be something that if you get together, you know, I'll tell you, in the times that I've gotten together, the one thing that I always try to do, I always try to end up, and I say, well, how can I pray for you? I've had people that are Hindus, that are atheists, that don't believe in prayer, but I've, you know, I'll talk to an atheist, and I'll say, no, you, no, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in prayer, but I do, and, and being that I believe that prayer really helps, I would like to pray for you. Is there something I can pray for you about? And, uh, and I'll ask him that, and then I'll follow up, you know, you know, a couple weeks later, I'm praying for that, how's that going? Now, the thing is, it's hard, you know, people say, I can't share my faith. It's hard for people to get mad at me when I'm offering to pray for them. And what will happen is there will be people that are just close to the gospel, but when I get together with them on a regular basis, they know that I care about them. I'm asking to pray for them. Over time, the door opens up spiritually. I remember, again, one, one friend of mine where, again, was very close to the gospel, self-proclaimed atheist, and we spent several years getting together, and we just spent time together, and I asked how he's doing, and I talked very little about spiritual things, and I always offer to pray for him. And one day he says, you know, after a couple years of getting together, he says, Mike, you're different than most Christians I know. He says, most Christians try to tell me about Jesus. I tell them I'm not interested. They tell me I'm going to hell and they leave me there. He says, you actually care about me. And, and after two years of saying, you care about me, you care about who I am, then he in essence said, okay, now I'm willing to listen to the gospel. See, that's where we go. Are we willing to pray and then spend time And just even if it goes no further, then how can I pray for you? If we spend that intentional time, let God use it. Third of all, then pray that God would would allow you to be part of leading at least one person to Christ over the next two years. Very specific. God, I pray that you give me a chance to share my faith. Help me to see the opportunities and pray on a daily basis. God, I pray that you'd give me a chance to lead at least be a part of leading one person to Christ in the next two years. Now, I've tell you, I've done this before. I have given this challenge before in different contexts. And over the years, I'll, I will do it two years, and then after two years, we'll come back and say, do you all remember that? And the vast majority of people that will come back and say, oh, yeah, I remember that. I made a commitment. I need to pray more often. I haven't been doing that. I'll always have a handful of people that say, I've been praying every day for those people. And you know what? I've never, I've never had someone said, I've prayed every day, and has not also said, and, I've, and someone's come to know Christ never seen it happen now when you look at that you say I want to be part of something big I want to be part of something eternal I don't know if I can do it God what do I have to offer it's not about us the whole idea of prayer why do we start there because if you think it's about your ability to say it right you're not going to do it if you think it's about their ability to be able to somehow figure it out you're going to get discouraged when they let you down when you realize that it's not about you and it's not about them it's about God the issue is not whether you can say it right it's not whether they can figure it out it's can God change a heart and you know what I believe the same God that took Saul who was on the road to Damascus ready to go kill a bunch of Christians and met him on the road and changed him like that is the same God that's at work today and, and I can be very, you know, think nothing of what I have to say and be very discouraged by the person's response. But boy, if I'm really encouraged by God's ability to do miracles, I'm going to keep praying and I'm going to pray with expectation because I believe if I keep praying, I'm going to get to see some miracles. Do you believe that? I mean, that's what I believe. That's what I believe when you say that we are called to storm the gates of hell and the gates of hell will not be able to withstand our advance. That's what I believe when God calls us to this. Now, the challenge is how do we remember? I want to tell you, we're going to try to do a couple little things. We've got in the back, we've got a little sticker, you know, hashtag pray for three. For those that are older, it's, it's pound pray for three. Um, you know, it's just a little sticker. And what we want to do is to have you take this, put it somewhere, you know, take this, put it somewhere where you see it every day as a little reminder. But I'm going to give you a more specific idea. We've really thought about how to do this. And if, and if you're, if, you know, most of us are in the days in where we actually know, you know, texting is a, a little thing. We're going to be setting up a texting chain, and we're gonna to try to every morning, you know, not early in the morning, mid-morning, every morning we wanna send out a text reminder for those who would like it. 
if you look at the whole take three, two, one challenge, on the back, it's what are the names? I give you five because you can go more than three, but what are at least three names? On the front, it's please, please text me a daily encouragement reminder to stay faithful to these commitments. If you are want, want to do that in that reminder, put your text number. We're gonna give you a chance in a minute to write that down. We're gonna have elders at the door to collect it on the way out. And if you do that, within the next week, we're gonna set up a thing where we're gonna send you every day a text reminder. Now I will tell you, it's not a reminder to pray for those three and take it, because if you get that reminder and if you take one minute to pray for those people, and if you do that every day, man, you'll be shocked what happens. I'm, I look forward because I'm gonna be shocked what happens. But I wanna encourage not only that, if you're there and you're part of that, and you're saying, boy, I'm meeting with somebody, let us know. Oh, here's a special need, let us know. Because you know, because if you tell me, then I'll send that back out in the text message and we'll let people know because there's something incredible when you get to be a part of praying. Are you willing to do this? Are you willing to say, okay, God, I wanna be a part of it. And we're gonna do some, some things a little different in closing here. We're gonna, in a moment, I'm gonna pray and Dave's gonna come up and he's gonna to start to lead us in song. And I want you, in as we begin this song, to think, are you willing to do this? If you are, who are the people that you want to put there? Do you want to be part of that text reminder? And uh, let me pray, and, and again, be thinking about that. Say, I'm asking, are, are you willing to respond? Say, I want to be a part of this.